The, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for the delay. I know that traffic can be a little bit difficult, especially this time of day in this area. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adam Kenyon. I am the Deputy Chief of Fisheries here at the agency. Um, Pat is actually in New York at Mid-Atlantic right now, so he will be joining us via the phone, but he won't be here in person. So I'll be leading you guys through this meeting tonight. Uh, for the audience, as we go through these, we will have an opportunity as we go through this to have public comment. So if you have some thoughts and opinions on things we're talking about, we will provide an opportunity during the meeting for you guys to speak. Uh, a couple announcements. We have worked as an agency with our law enforcement division to add law enforcement presence at these meetings. Instead of having a different person each time, we have kind of we have assigned a specific officer to each committee. So we do have with us Captain Miller from the middle area. So he will be a consistent face that this committee sees, and hopefully that will go a long way to having some consistent input and some opinions from law enforcement as we start moving through some of these items. Great. Thank you. Um, as a reminder from last meeting, just to kind of set the stage with everything we've gone through and what we're looking for tonight as staff and as an advisory committee. The, the purpose of last meeting was really present the winter dredge survey results to this committee, as well as present harvest from Maryland and from Virginia, as well as harvest from Virginia. As we look back at that winter dredge survey, we do, know, we do see that total abundance, adult female abundance, adult male abundance are all the lowest they've been in the last five years. Total crab abundance across the bay is the lowest in the 33 year history, down 20%. And juvenile abundance is the second lowest on history. A, a couple that kind of sets the stage for what we are looking at tonight. In the last meeting, we had a lot of topics that we went over as far as possible management options. Some of the good things that came out of that meeting, I believe it was uh, Commissioner Tankard that asked this committee, are these winter dredge surveys results something that the watermen are seeing on the water? And I think the consensus was that, yes, abundance is low. We are, we are seeing these, maybe not exactly, but we are seeing this show up in our harvest. We are so seeing this show up on the water. One of the other things that was interesting that came out of this meeting last time was, I believe, from, uh, from Mr. Cox talking with Rom that he has seen Rom talk at these meetings for a very long time. And when Rom or Vims has an opinion that the survey is not in a great shape, it, it is something that we should listen to as an agency, something we should listen to as an advisory committee. We threw out a lot of suggestions on what to do. As far as management options, we promised we would come back tonight with some options on seasons, with some options on bushel limits, so we will be going over that. We also got a lot of guidance from this committee on what those seasons might look like, what was important to this committee, what was important to watermen during what times of years. We met since that last meeting in that two weeks. We have met with the our jurisdictions, including Maryland and PRFC. All three jurisdictions are on board that we're, we're in a situation where something significant is needed across all jurisdictions. So before I put this back over to Commissioner Tankard to do the minutes, I want to give you everyone a minute to digest that. And when you guys approve the minutes, if you have any questions after that about what you heard from last meeting, either on the winter dredge survey or the harvest, we're happy to answer those expectations of staff tonight what we would like from this committee is some kind of consensus of bushel limits consensus of season limits we also have a lot of other items that you got in the printout that we sent ahead of time we would also like from this committee some kind of priority list on what we want to look at those other things on the list are analysis we can't do in two weeks and we won't have them available for you tonight but we do need to prioritize them through the fall, and we need to come back so we want to know from this committee what's really important, what's really going to get it conserving abundance, what's really going to get it conserving juveniles. 
So we'd like to get through all those tonight as well as set up. We'll probably be back here in August. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Tankard to go through the minutes. And if anyone has any questions after that, we're happy to answer them before we get started on the other stuff. All right, well, has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes from the last meeting? So does it look like what, what took place? Any amendments or corrections? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to pass the minutes as submitted. All right. Second, anyone? I'll second. Great. All right. Minutes been uh, all, all, all in favor. Signify by playing, saying aye. Excuse me. Aye. Aye. Okay. Right. So minutes approved. So we'll move on then. I, w I will ask the committee that we would like to get through bushel limits and we'd like to get through seasons first. If you have comments or thoughts on some of those other options or other things around there, we can move through that after we do the bushel limits and after we look through the season. But this can be a pretty heavy and we do have time in the fall to come back and revisit that. So we'd like to try and stay on task to try and talk about those specifically as we go through them. Okay. So I'm gonna turn this over to Alexa to go through some of those bushel limits. Great, thank Thanks, you Alexa. Everyone. So as Adam said, staff's been working to come up with uh, some options. So the way we're kind of splitting things out are things we can go to our commission with this month in June to go into place July 5th because as you know, the bushel limits technically end July 4th of this year. So um, on this slide are things we can do for July 5th, 2022. And then later we'll get to the rest of the things that can be done for next crabbing season. Um, some things, you know, we can't interrupt the fishery partway through the year and some things are just gonna take a lot more analysis than we have time to do right now. So we have a few categories here. Um, this is the season laid out as when the season opens and when the low bushel limit would end, this would be technically for next year, for 2023. And then for 2022, when that low bushel limit will start and then when the season will close. So we have our status quo, what's currently on the books right now we have, if we put some of those long-term changes into effect that we mentioned, the agents, transfers, sanctuaries, what have you, we can take less of a reduction for the bushel limits and or the season dates now. Um, and we have two options for those. So one, the season would open March 17th and be, um, have the low bushel limits into effect through May 15th. And then the low bushel limit begin November 1st, season close November 15th. The other option shifts two weeks of the low bushel limit into the fall. So the season would open March 17th, low bushel limit end April 30th. And then for this year, the low bushel limit would begin October 16th, season close November 15th. So that's something we're gonna look for input on. Um, we are gonna have to have an extended period of the low bushel limit. Do we prefer two more weeks in the spring of the low bushel limit? Would we prefer two more weeks of the low bushel limit in the fall? Um, that's something we'd like to hear from the committee and the public on. Uh, we have um, two more categories of bigger cuts, which is if we wanna take less action for next season on those long-term solutions. And if we don't wanna take, if we don't wanna take any um, changes to those long-term limits. So that would be the most restrictive. So taking some long-term changes, we'd be looking at uh, season open March 17th through uh, low bushel limit ending on June 30th. And then for this year, the low bushel limit beginning October 1st, season closed November 15th. If the committee doesn't wanna recommend any long-term changes, 
we would have the season open April 1st, low bushel limit ending uh, June 30th, low bushel limit this year beginning October 1st, and closing November 15th. So those are the first things we're talking about. Uh, with season, with changes to the season and the bushel limits, we'd also be looking to change uh, for the all other gears for your crab traps, trot line, peeler pots, to uh, take two weeks from the beginning and end of their seasons to open April 15th and October 15th. Those dates aren't set in stone. We can adjust those forward and back as the committee and the public recommends. And we're also possibly talking about um, closing the recreational five pot season a week earlier. Uh, it's currently open, open June 1st, and then closing September 9th instead of September 15th. So these are things we're looking for the committee's opinions on. Um, so take it away. All right, who wants, who wants to go first? I will. Good. Thank you. When are we going to get away from opening and closing? I don't know how many times I've said this over the years. It's all based on water temperature. You keep putting this time on it all the time. I've said this before, and other people this crab knows this too. I, one year I put pots out in February for two weeks, then got a snow blizzard, and I was done for a month and a half. We've got to have this committee, we've got to get away from this date. We all know, anybody who crabs knows it's all based on water. Farmers the same way. When you farm, you, you, plant, you can't plant corn in December. We all know this. So having, having a regulation on the books that makes absolutely no sense is ridiculous. We got to get away from opening and closing. It's all based on the water temperature. You, you can start at March 17th. That's been many years. You can't start till middle of April. That's been years you can start in February. So I don't know when this is going to happen, when we're going to get away from this, from this date. We've got to get to a water temperature. It's got to be 51 degrees in the bed for the pot to catch grass. And, and, and and so think, now, so if you, if you started in March and it's too cold, we won't start to say the 15th of April. <coughs> so, so nearly a month's gone by. Nobody's crabbed. And, I, I and understand then, then when mandatory report comes in, you go, oh my God, that you ought to see reports in April. Now, did these people caught nothing. Well, we can't catch you because it's too cold. And every, everything does happen around water temperature. Very, very aware of that. You're absolutely right in there. It's, different. it's difficult to write a regulation around water temperature. So other than get rid of season limits altogether, I do think that the options we put forward is staff's attempt to work with this committee to start moving away from the importance of season limits and bushel limits. When we start putting the other things on the table, I think that's where this committee can have input, can have that influence on saying these things that the staff is proposing are a lot more important to abundance than these season limits. And I think those are the first steps to start moving away from some of this stuff or not put the importance on it if we can get through some of those things that we inherently know are good for abundance and we can get that sustainable stock different ways yeah, I, I would like to see this committee at some point in time and make a recommendation to staff to do away with the time starting and finishing I, I i will say as a farmer you know, April 14th, Exmoor, Virginia is our frost-free date, and that's when we're going to think about planting corn. Right. And I mean, right. I ca 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 you know, at some point, calendar has to have some kind of significance in what you're doing and how you're planning. Uh -huh. you know? So I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to get away from the paradigm of using a calendar. I think it's been useful to us for a long time. I agree the water temperature can vary every year, and just like air temperature can. So. Uh -huh. And I've been burned by planting too early. So... Uh, you know, uh, I'm afraid the paradigm we have is what we got to work with. Uh, we, we're not. Well, the, this board can still make a recommendation. That's what sure, we're that's sure, what we're I, here agree, for. I agree. That's I agree. what we're here to, But to today we've got to work with what we well, have. That's what we got. That's what we're working on. Well, actually, that, we, we have, have everything starting on 17th of March. 
What's that? Uh, everything starts on the 17th of March except for no long-term changes is 1st of April. That's the only only one that, see, all, all the way across from status quo, there's no, no change in the spring season. Work. No. And I, just, just a little bit of background. We listened to this committee. I think some of the things the committee said were important were conserving females in the fall. It, I think one of the options we discussed and something that we have done in the past is close harvest to females at the end of November. Some of the feedback from this committee was it's hard to make a living that way that you'd get more savings and if you can't catch females maybe it is a better time to close. The other thing we heard from this committee is that we are concerned about over exploitation in the spring, right. about uh, individuals coming in with mm, a, a lot of pots in, in that early season. So when in the, those green columns A and B, you can see the only change in there is where are we taking the two weeks? Is it important to limit those two weeks in the spring? Is it more important to limit those two weeks in the fall? So we tried to use the input from this committee on some of those things rather than closing it completely to try and disincentivize early early harvest on those fish crabs. I will also add that when we looked at the size of the changes, we did average years. So we are going to have some years that had a warm March, some years that had a cool March. So we're not looking at one year where March had, you know, great harvest and saying, well, look at the savings we can have. We did make sure to spread our data out across several years so we weren't um, exaggerating the difference the, um, the savings a certain time could get us. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah, Adam, uh, I notice uh, you have everything closing on the 15th of November. Is that, is that pretty concrete, uh, uh, y'all? It, it's, it's pretty concrete. We, we do recognize that we need mm -hmm. some savings in November, those are mm -hmm. overwintering females. Mm -hmm. So the staff mm -hmm. is open to the idea of closing it earlier. Mm -hmm. If we want to look at November 10th, November 1st, uh, we, we can go that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. But the only way to actually save abundance is to have all gear out of the water. There's mm -hmm. no recoupment there. There is no gear in the water, so nothing is being met. That, that is true savings. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. November 15th yeah. it was a date yeah. that we felt yeah. comfortable. And mm -hmm. there isn't. A lot of harvest across the entire bay in those last two weeks, as, as Marshall said, you get a snowstorm, yeah, yeah. and it, it won't much. Well, it won't March, much yeah. I'm speaking of November, though. Oh, so here. so you say you're looking for five to ten percent reduction, right? We we are we're looking for reductions that help with abundance. We talk to all jurisdictions. We want to do something Every, significant. Everybody we, else. We, we don't want to. What we decided as jurisdictions is mm -hmm. we're not trying to target. 10%. Mm -hmm. We're trying to do yeah. management options that make sense for the fishery and that are conservation mark minded. Mm -hmm. We're not going to keep nickel and diming days or dip till we get to that magic 5.1%. That's not what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. We're trying to do enough across all options to say this is significant. This is going to increase abundance. Also with that season close date, looking at the data, there's a lot more harvest in the first half of November. Mm -hmm. So we could have gotten a lot more savings by closing November 1st. Mm -hmm. But we said, you know, it might be better for the fishery if instead we, we maybe extended that low bushel limit so people mm -hmm. can still go out, they can still be crabbing mm -hmm. and still get some of those savings by not closing the fishery. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. down the end of the tube. Oh. It just seems like to me all the rules are only geared to the guys that crab in the beginning and at the end and the full-time guys. you got a lot of part-time people that do it for two weeks or two months a year, and we're not doing anything. We don't even know what a full-time crabber is. We're not even doing anything to attack. It's not the over-exploitation in the spring. They're not bringing tons of pots. It's that you got people that don't work two or three months later or don't work all year putting the pots over. That's why you see a lot of gear come because it's only coming for a few weeks to try to go get the – you know, that big run of spring crabs, that's when they're coming. These guys don't participate in the fishery the whole time. And you know, like in November, what you're, you're taking and taking and taking, there's industry and businesses that, I mean, we went from a 12 month fishery, we're working on getting it to a seven month fishery. You know, what time do the people that are participating full time, is, is there gonna be anything like done to try to keep them in business? Or are we just trying to create a hobby fishery? Or? We tend to, 
target or look at the end of season, beginning of season because of logistics of setting pots. Having a two week closure, or three week closure in the middle of the season is not reasonable for the watermen. That, that, that's why we look at the spring and fall. We, we've gone down these roads many times trying to define what a full time waterman is and how to keep them in business. Well, you know, they did it for the oyster fishery. They were adamant. They had no problem deciding what full-time was. So I don't know why we have such an issue in the crab fishery deciding. Full-time as far as how many days they work? We need to do something because and, how the and, same people should, they're not the people that just participate for a couple weeks here and there. They're not having to deal with none of the regulations and they're just getting to create, doing their same business as usual. You're not affecting them at all. And the sta staff agrees with you. And when we, we transition from this to some of those longer term things, uh, you'll we'll start hitting on some of those things like what's what what is full time to be able to transfer? Well, how do agents work? Are I you mean, a part time like guy? Agents, or you just it's not enough for the full time guys. Why do we still have people running a side business with agents running their business? I mean, there's and that's something we need to come back in the fall. And we really need because I mean, those things are you're you're absolutely right. Those things are <coughs> affecting the fishery. I mean, like the crab houses, they're they're dying, they're gone. I mean, the places that depend on these crabs. I mean. These industries, once they're gone, they don't come back. I mean, they don't. They don't just say we're going to wait till next year. When it's good, we'll we'll reopen. I mean, the taxes keep coming. The, I mean, the upkeep on the buildings and stuff. I mean, people. It's just at some point in time, we got to do something and to keep it rolling. Because if not, you're not going to have nothing to be here worried about. We'll be a black and white picture on the wall somewhere in here. We're look at what we used to could do. And, and that's where staff will look for when I say you guys can influence and you guys can have long-term decisions on some of these fisheries. We're going to visit a lot of those topics that, that Ken just hit on. No, we hear you. I mean, I think this memo, did you get this? They talked yeah. about the exact things that you're talking about. Yeah. For a long term, we've got to address it. I yeah. totally agree. Uh, yes, sir. They, they, what they didn't talk about that Ken brought up is not your full time commercial waterman, because I remember one of the guys in the back was talking about this. He sets his crab pots two months of the year, and then he goes to gillnet, and then he goes to oyster. So that's not the man that we're talking about. We're talking about the person who's a retiree or a part timer who um, can take off a month or two weeks here and there. And he'll go out and set out 100 pots when it's the peak of the season for harvest. And, and they'll make maybe $10,000, $5,000 of income a year out of that. That's the people that I think you need to, to, to try to tease out how to deal with. And, and that, again, that's something we can't, we can't do that right now. That's something for the 2023 season. I'm, I'm so not debating that, but that has never been... That did not get discussed at the last meeting as something for staff to look into. How do we deal with the true part-time hobbyist crabber who doesn't do any other uh, water act, water commercial water fit or fisheries activity? All right. All right, down I, I the think, table um, here, Sanford. I've got a question. So you're going to close November 15th. What kind of percentage savings do you get in that? And how many watermen are you affecting that crab? those last 15 days uh, again it's it's not tied to it's not tied to a percentage it, it, okay so when, so when you take the pots out of the water there's true savings in not having those pots <clears throat> in the water that that harvest at the end of november it, it is minimal as, as you okay. know with so it in does other affect words, certain you, areas more than others you basically it's kind of like a feel-good thing is what i mean to put it in terms you're just closing it down it, it looks good and it's really not achieving a lot but we, in, we in do my, get we do opinion. get savings and we're tr um so what, the idea with doing things the beginning and end of the year is that that's when we're trying to protect the females. Yeah. So well, if we can get a little less pressure on them when they're coming, um, settle in for winter. Well, I and can... I'll also add that in the last few years, April has been the peak of harvest. You know, right. in maybe five, ten years ago, we were seeing more July, August being the peak of the fishery. <laughs> the last few years, it's been big Aprils. And then another peak in July and August, not as big. So that's what I was saying. There is no full time crabbers. It's so expensive and stuff. People don't do it. It's not, that's why they come out and get the quit. They're not there. The crabbers aren't there all summer and stuff like that. They're not, I know the reports might be coming in because people obviously want to keep their licenses active, but the crabbers aren't there. I mean, you can have, there's plenty of people. Go talk to people that buy crabs, go talk to people that sell bait, people that sell supplies. The crabbers aren't there. So that's why you used to see them 
participate then because it was for a bust. People did it as a full-time gig. Now you're not seeing that. That's why the dynamics of the fishery are changing. Everybody doesn't crab in the fall because they go oystering, and everybody doesn't crab in the summer because it costs so much money. The pots get dirty. The people come out for a little bit in the springtime and get. That's why you see. That's why all those statistics have changed. I mean, pretty sure people, anybody that crabs in the, in the springtime should will tell you the same thing. So that's why we are trying to bring those um, bushel limits down during the spring. And I believe um, Chief Gear wanted to say something. Pat, <coughs> you had your hand up? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Um, and I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm stuck in New York at a council meeting. Um, but I just wanted to you know, bring up about the, the, the part time. Um, <clears throat> we can address that. We can't address it right now. Uh, Tom, you mentioned it. If you want us to look into it, we can look into it next year to come up with a definition that's full time or, or part time. Similar to what do they have for oysters. Um, there are some things we can do next year. We can't tell if somebody has their license. We we can't tell them that when they when they you know when they can fish and when they can't. If they decide they want to fish for two weeks and get out and go somewhere else, that's their business. I mean, unless they we're going to start buying licenses back as we did years ago. So, um, but we can look at you know there are things we can do next year. You know, looking at if you want to transfer, similar to what they have with oysters, if you want to transfer your license, license you had to have 40, 40 days of activity the year before, something like that. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, they, they, you know, what we what we really need to concentrate on is these issues right here in front of us, and you know, what do we want to do in the in the immediate term, right now, and then we will have, be having other meetings in the future to talk about what we can do in the you know, for next year in 2020. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so to staff, just so we can focus on what you're thinking about for right now, the last two lines, that's it. We're not going to do anything in the spring. No, we, we are. We are. We, it, it is difficult to talk about fall bushel limits and fall seasons right. without recognizing that the spring is going to happen as well. Okay, so, so what, when what, we what we propose tonight is, yes, we are going to come in, we are going to set bushel limits starting in July, and we're also going to set bushel limits for the spring. You can see three different colors up there. So oh. we can come back as staff and as a committee and adjust those spring bushel limits. There's still time. We could come back in January and adjust those. If we can do some of these other things that are conservation minded, we won't have to come back in and adjust them down more. These are up there to kind of make the point or understand that there is more conservation to do than just what you see in green. There is more to do. And if the committee chooses not to have some opinions on those or we decide those aren't important, there are other avenues to decrease harvest. And, and, I, and I think that's what's important to, to see. Mr. Moore. Um, first of all, thanks for putting all this together. I hey, know it was, hey, a, Phil. Phil. No, it was uh, short term to do it. Uh, I think I wanted to get some input from other folks on the on the committee and, and also from staff. Um, you know, this tail end of the season in November, I know, is a big issue for a number of crabbers. It, if if we were to go to low bushel limits October one, but keep the season at November thirtieth, would that be an even trade for you all? And then I wanted to see how that. What the input from from you all who are in the industry all the time would so that crabs are pretty cheap in October, so probably don't want to cut on the bushel and chew on them too early until you know what I'm saying. I'm just saying. But I think the is, is the is, is that though a trade off where hey you have a low bushel limit that starts but 15 days earlier, but you get two yeah, more weeks of the season. What I'm saying is that that low bushel limit yeah, really prices if you really just. It depends on where you sell. Probably. For you, it's low. It, the price is not low for me. And I didn't say it was low for me. I'm talking about other people. I'm making yeah. it fine. I'll speak it for everybody. I'll just speak for myself. You know what I mean? So you gotta uh, look out for the industry as a whole. One, one thing that Chris did br bring up is we, we do have some very bright minds here on staff. One of the recent staff we brought on is Dr. Brooke Lohman. Um, she was able to create an app that kind of does a lot of this information on the fly. So although we can't look at everything, we do have the ability to adjust to look at what's important to the committee. So when Chris says that, we can semi on the fly look at some of those things as long as we're not 
overwhelming the things we're trying to look at. So it's more important to figure out the way Chris um, said it, what's important? Are, is the November 15th closure important? Is the November 30th closure important? Are reduced bushel limits in the spring or the fall important to this committee? And we can find some common ground around those. What you see on the board isn't the only thing you can do. It's really just setting it up that this time period, these dates are important to this committee. This is more important. Can we take a look at that? So we can look at some of those things, but I can't look at all those things if we throw out 100 different suggestions. Let, let me ask a follow-up to Mr. Diggs. If we went to a lower bushel limit, though, in October, might that raise the price because the, there won't be somebody being called? I mean, that's one of the things we always talk about with bushel limit. It also depends on you can't control North Carolina, Louisiana. Like right now, they weren't catching a whole lot of jimmies, but the price was down. It should have been sky high, but they were getting all they wanted from Louisiana. You know what I mean? So it, it's hard when you get chewing on that, to, you know. That's you can't you can't control what the other states bring in here. We don't have any, you know. So I don't, you know. In October, a lot of people quit and go oystering and stuff. So I don't know how many people it would affect. But the guys that are crabbing, I mean, usually in like September, October, you need to kind of be on bulk crabs, like selling. You know what I mean? Because the side market and stuff. Because the crabs aren't full of egg and stuff. Then so it's really not heated up on getting the big money and sending them up the road. I mean that the last two weeks in November. Are, you make a lot of money because the crabs, the egg content is high. It's a sought after item. They want them up and down the East Coast and, you know, they live good. And so, I mean, that's, I mean, that is a big, that's a hard two weeks for the guys that participate in it. I mean, that's, See, the, I mean, the, it's the, significant. The bulk of your market going north that time of year, Asians. And, and that's in they November. Want, they want high egg content. Right. Yeah. But, so Pete, <clears throat> you, you, you're full time. <laughs> what, what, what do you think about an earlier lower bushel limit and running that season in November, November 30th? For me or for everybody else? Well, for, for folks you know in, in the industry. Well, you know, I run a retail business, and we don't deal in a high volume of crab. You know, I can't tell you the last time I caught a limit of crabs. I, did, I, don't, I don't have my market when we stand it. I'm just a little small market. So we catch what we need and we quit. But when the season ends early, <coughs> that hurts me because I can't work right at all. Um, I don't know how many people there are like that. Uh, I've just said something to Ken about these bushel limits. How many how many crabbers do the bushel limits really affect anymore? You know, I know they affect all the big rigs, but do they affect the smaller people? Yeah. You know, I, 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 no way I, I'm going to go catch 27 bushels, you know. I mean, I, I used to, but I, I, you know, I changed my business plan. I, you know, I was talking to one of these young fellows the other day. I said, shoot, I remember working off of Willoughby one day, and a friend of mine's boat broke down, so we crabbed my rig and his rig. There weren't any bushel limits back then. Damn near sunk the boat. You know, it had a little over 100 bushels on a 35-foot boat. Right. Uh, those days are long gone. Yeah. Part of it's to limits, part of it's to the, you know, you know it's, it's not there anymore. I mean, the limits, they only really going to hurt the guy that's got yeah, they're guy, the full-time guy that's really trying to, yeah, well, they put the, to make it. You know, <clears throat> with the big boat and all, all, all the ponds. Mr. Cox. There's, there's, there's a lot of people that have s scaled back, not just me because of my age yeah. or, 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 or my business. They just haven't, haven't done it. Part of it's been a characteristic of... <clears throat> lack of availability of, of what we sell the most of. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a huge market for sponge crabs part of the year because people don't want to deal with them. I don't cook crabs or anything like that. And we, we <coughs> built our business around clean females and male crabs. And, you know, there's not many of them around anymore. All right, Mr. Cox, you, you, uh, you're, you're basing this reduction just on the winter crab survey just because this one particular winter crab survey is bad it is is that correct well it was the winter dredge survey um the vims juvenile trawl survey also bears out those results that was something the committee asked us to look at last year um, and also that harvest was down last year and also consistent con relatively consistent 
over the 33 years. The, the, the similar patterns in there that Ram pointed out last that concerned where we could be going if we don't do something. Okay. So it's a year or two. No, What's it, been happening for the last year or two, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Next question. I understand. What happens next year? Say we do something now. What happens next year when the Wonder Crab survey is up? Are we going to be back here saying, okie dokie, now we had this one year that everybody was so shook up and worried about? Because I've said it many times, and Pete's been here a long time too. Once we do one thing, it's almost impossible to get that changed. So if, you know, I want to know if, if my next question is going to be is what is this your recommendation as it stands if we do nothing? I've been here a long time. I know the game. So what, what if we decide tonight, law enforcement can tell you over oh, my way is that we already got a reduction. If you ride around the docks over home, the damn docks were full of crab pots. So that tells me something's happening already. There's a lot of people not crabbing. There's a reduction right there. I can't speak for the Western Shore. It's a but ghost town in a lot of places. My, what's that? It's a ghost town in a lot of places. Fuel, $6, base. I'm talking about, I'm talking about crab pots on the dock. Yeah. You never see crab pots <clears> on the dock this time of year. You can't even see the boats for the dock. Y'all Russian shoremen, is that true? Do you have pots on the dock? Law enforcement should be able to verify that. Anytime you've got crab pots screwed all the way around the dock, they're not old board. That's some type of reduction. But two, we're doing this because of one bad survey. Now, it could be bad, next year it could be good. But my question is, <coughs> What is staff, is this staff's recommendation? If we do nothing, is this your recommendation in front of the commission? So to answer a couple of your questions, we have, we do have a track record in decent years, work, recent years working with this committee of bringing things back. We did have no female harvest after the 20th. We did extend that to November 20, to the end of November. We even had a crab season into December recently, so there is a lot of that had to do with my water temperature speech right. I made for years. But, but there, there is room. That. There is room for with good surveys to expand the fishery as well. So that, that's the first thing. As far as staff's recommendation, our recommendation is going to be conservation-minded. Um, we would like to go with option A or B or something around there. We're bringing these to the committee to get their input. I think one other option that was already thrown out was having the season open till the end of November and moving those back to October. So no bushel limit. We, we're not settled on any one of those. We would like something that is equivalent to A or B. And as we move through this fall, if we can't come to consensus on these other conservation things that Ken is talking about and Tom's bringing up, that we're going to have to revisit this and possibly do some more conservation. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that, that, that worried me is that kind of, maybe I'm wrong, but it kind of reads like blackmail. If we, if we do a little something now, it won't be as bad when we come back again, when you make more recommendations. If we don't do something now, mm -hmm. you're going to come back with even harder the next time around. So it's uh, if we don't do something now, they're going to make it worse next time. If we do something now, they may make it better next time. Well, hold on. The one thing I'll say is we know that if we can conserve females, whether it's the spring part of the year or the fall part of the year, we're doing something for the benefit of the population of the bay. Well, Mr. For Chairman, crabs. we, but, we so, but, but, a lot on. of females. Yeah, we yeah, but I mean, we've got to do, we know we need to do something one way or another. Right. So I don't, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> whether it's blackmail or just common sense, uh, yeah. you know. Do a little something now and not ahead, so much sorry. next question, time. Yeah. That is, am I basically right? I, I think I, I think the idea is there's a lot of things we can do all of the seasons, all of the bushel limits. We talked to the other jurisdictions and they're all in the same line that we do need to do something as a bay that's pretty significant. Has Merlin brought up anything that they're willing to do in Potomac River Fisheries? So at their, uh, at their last Crab Advisory Committee, Maryland, um, they've been talking about decreasing bushel limits for females, 
and decreasing the season for males. Talking about that, I've heard that through the years too. That, 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 that's what their that's yeah, what their I've committee that has recommended. Too. We wound up doing something they did nothing. That's where we're keeping as much as two bushels off their limit. They're yeah, really looking out. Not 15. What is that? Three. I cut, three I cut them short. Yeah, one. It's yeah. three. It's not two. It's three. Yeah, I've heard this we're before. I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, here's the fact. I've said it forever. If normally, if we work with them, we benefit. If we don't work with them, we lose. I, I, these people get paid to stand in front of commission and saying this is what we think needs to be done. Right, and if the craft them. committee works with them, and I hate, but that's that's how it works. And 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 maybe tonight we can come up with something that we how can all, come all agree adjust, with. How would you have to adjust the bushel limits to keep the season up until the 30th? Like how mm -hmm. would that? How can you finagle the bushel limits? Do we have a proposal for that? We'll, we'll get there in one second, Commissioner mm -hmm. Tinker. Pat Pat would like to is on the phone. Okay. And some yeah, let's hear from help Pat. guide this conversation. That'd be great, Pat. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to address what Marshall was saying. Marshall, I, I want to go back to, you, you know, in, in early 1990s, where basically the female, start, the adult female spawning stocks start, started dropping in 1994. By 1998, all the sectors of the, of the fishery were down. They were at their lowest levels ever, and they stayed that way for 10 years because you know, we weren't taking enough action. If we could have taken precautionary action sooner, we may have seen some better response. We don't want to wait, you know, we don't just have one year. We have two years, the two worst years of juvenile recruitment ever. And those females are going to be, those, those juveniles are going to be entering the fishery starting in August. So, and we've seen a reduction in the spawning stock. The experts are telling us, you know, on our CBSAC, Tom Miller, saying, we're going to have probably a lower spawning stock next year as a result. He, he basically said, I almost guarantee it, we're going to have a lower spawning stock. The experts are telling us we need to do something. So I, I don't think, you know, and it's not about, you know, we're taking away from you. We're trying to protect it so it doesn't, you know, the bottom line is the abundance is low now. If we don't do anything, abundance will remain low. If we try to do something to, you know, help it out a little bit, it may recover quicker. You don't want to go through another 10 year period like we did in the 90s and early 2000s. Things are great back then. So we need to come up with a plan. Adam, I mean, how does this commission feel about uh, trigger? Uh, on, we're, we're managing for female abundance, right? Yes. So we supposedly had 97 million last year. Anything over 70 doesn't cause a lot of concern. I mean, it's causing some concern, but we're not overfishing uh, the fishery. So if we, if next year, if it, sh if it shows 130, 140 million, 120 million uh, females, I mean, uh, would y'all give us the insurance that uh, if we do these changes, that once the female abundance gets above, a, say, a three-year average of the last three years or something, I mean, we've got to come up with a number. Uh, would that be something that, that y'all would entertain? <clears throat> a trigger is something we can talk about. Yep. What strikes me when I look at the winter dredge survey results mm -hmm. is that our juvenile population is below where it was pre-2008, mm -hmm. but our females are above. Mm -hmm. So female management appears to be working, it's just there seems to be some sort of disconnect mm -hmm. in the turning juvenile. those females mm -hmm. into juveniles. Yeah. So that's what Rom was saying with his mm -hmm. concern is when they're trying to come down the bay to spawn mm -hmm. in spring, um, when they're trying to settle mm -hmm. in fall, mm -hmm. that's where we're trying to get the savings. Mm -hmm. um, we've got um, a scientific workshop later this year to try mm -hmm. to figure out more about where that disconnect is. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we would manage only based on female, female you could abundance, do it on total abundance, but with female and that. juvenile total, that can be, we just, that can I, be something I think, we talk about. I think most of the watermen want some kind of assurance that if we, if we make these changes, when everybody wants to see a healthy fishery, but if we do these things, then you know we've got a, we've done a lot of stuff over the years. We never got back. We never got bushel limits back. We never got pot limits back. I mean, it's just I can go on and on. And and I think the watermen just want some kind of assurance that you know that that when it does come back, that that we will sit down at the table and be able to go back to status quo if that's what it takes. You know, I, I think that's the main con concern, right? 
And I, th I think that's the goal, too. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think everybody has that. Um, so the couple of years in these surveys, we come out, we see all these small crabs in the survey. How come they've never translated into growing up and into the fishery? Like, we see them, and then we're waiting, and then we'll see them moisture drudging, and people see them when you're fishing in the lights or when you cut open a red drum or a, rock, or a catfish. You'll see plenty of them. Why are these crabs never making it to the fishery? We cut out a whole fishery. We've closed down the middle of the bay. We took our crab pots. We've done season closures. But it's never once translated into making it any better. Like, what is happening? Why? I mean, the peeler pot guys aren't doing great. The crabbers aren't doing great. Where are they going from, like, these studies when we see them all? Where? Where, where are we losing them at? Is a lot, of, a lot of them do translate. So we I, have... I, I'm talking about... I know how the study says, but I'm talking about guys that are out there crabbing. We see this stuff. They're, we study it however many days you crab. The studies there, I mean, I'm just saying, like, we don't... I haven't seen... They closed a the whole fishery down. Everybody was telling you they'd be coming out in the water and be so many crabs, and it made absolutely zero difference. You can talk to the people crabbing. It, it made no difference. So what... I mean... I just don't understand, like, how do, are we really going to sit here and think that it, that it's going to make a difference? I mean, because I don't see where we've come anywhere where it's gotten any better. We had a 12-month fishery in 2006 and seven, and now we're down to, like, seven and a half, eight months. I mean, something, I mean, to just keep doing the same rules, I mean, maybe it's not us. You know, maybe some, there's a reason that they're not living. Maybe they're getting pulled out of the bay. Maybe they're getting eaten. I don't know, but it just seems like we're beating a dead horse here. Well, what we do see is that years of high juvenile abundance are generally followed by a year of good harvest. A year of low juvenile abundance, low harvest. And we saw that in 2021. We had that year of low juvenile abundance. Next year was low harvest. So we do see that translated into real terms, not just survey terms, but what you guys on the water are seeing. And if it's just an up and down roller coaster, does it really matter what we do? Is it gonna just do its own thing next year? I mean, I'm just, I don't know. It seems like we're just doing something for the sake of doing it because we feel like we should or we have to to appease someone. But I just, so I'd like to figure out whatever's gonna be the easiest on everybody because I don't know that getting too crazy is really gonna help. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Nixon. Um, What's that? Do, do you have any idea what kind of effect this is going to have on anything or is it a kind of a shot in the dark is it a wish and hope or do you when, when have you, an idea what kind of percentage we we have an idea of what kind of percentage <clears throat> that, that this might want. we we do have that idea but but we're trying not to lock into we're trying to hit this you know we're, we're trying to do things when we look at those two greens we're trying to figure out what's important to this to the fishery is it important to stay open later is it important to yeah, conserve I, I, I understand that but I'm we're just, not we're not trying to I'm, get I'm to trying to quantify percent. what all this is going to accomplish uh, do you do you know if, if we go through the whole list of things do you think we'll get a 10 percent a 15 or 25 percent potential I mean potential. I know you I know potentially it could it some of it like some of it depends on the other the other yeah. options we attack this fall they, they all don't work independently. They all play off each other. So right, it, yeah, we, it could be upwards of that. But with, with recruitment and bushing. You know, I've been doing this a long time, and we've done, like JC said, all kinds of things. And we, we've been keeping pretty good logs, not just for reporting purposes, but since 1993 when this went through, we not only keep our reports, we keep a log, you know, weather and who caught what and whatever. There's all kinds of stuff written in the book. And uh, every, every year it goes like this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, there, there was one year, I think, I'm trying to think what year it was, probably probably 2014 or something. <coughs> what year was it that they made that documentary where you all came out on the boats with us and everything? Yeah, I think it was yeah, fall. It was when all those crabs showed up in the fall. I don't know. Yeah, we had all kinds of crabs. Really I thought, oh, man, we've really done something. And then, poof, the next year they were gone. <laughs> right. 14, you know? 14 was a low I think that was maybe a cold year mm -hmm. and then it shot right back up in 2015 is mm -hmm. that maybe what you're I don't thinking know. of we, we, we had crabs where where I am mm -hmm. you know like like we had back you know in the 90s mm -hmm. yes, sir. It was only one it was only one year and then they, they were gone again uh, Adam uh, does this commission feel that predation is a problem yeah absolutely 
Okay. I, I didn't don't see anything about it. That's why I'm asking. But it, it's not one of those things that we can just manage Quantify. out of the fishery, yeah. and it's not a short-term right. thing that we can tackle right yeah. here two weeks into June. Yeah, it I, seems I, like we, we, rec we recognize well, looked, that uh, as an issue. You know, you're looking at black drum. Um, yeah, black drum, minimum 16 inches. One fish. You're allowed to keep one fish. Oh, I'm not talking about anything on the commercial side. I'm talking on the recreational side. Red drum, uh, three fish, 18 to 26 inches. Uh, blue catfish, you can catch all the blue catfish, but you can't keep anything over 32 inches. And, of course, snakeheads in the upper part of our rivers, that, that's a you know, pretty big problem, too. So I think every waterman here recognizes that, that predation is a, is a problem, and I think that's where a lot of our juvenile crabs are going to. We catch more pounds of catfish sometimes up mm -hmm. James River than you catch crabs yeah. in the day's time in your crab pots. Yeah, I got a picture on here that shows a 26-inch red drum. It's got about 35 crabs in it, soft crabs. I'm sure everybody's seen it, you know. And how many thousands of times... A day does that happen on the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, so it, it's a problem, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, y'all control the regulations on on the the saltwater fishing regulation for black drum and red drum, don't oh, you? But we also have other other assessments in other states that uh -huh. we need to work okay. with as well. It's not as as simple as yeah. trying to solve one problem yeah. by just changing another. It almost seems like we're feeding fish is all we're doing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's outside of this committee. We are working with the Invasive Catfish Work Group mm -hmm. to try to increase uh, marketability of the blue catfish, mm -hmm. right. oh, yeah. which could increase prices, mm -hmm. increase opportunity for people switching into blue catfish mm -hmm. to try to get some of those out of our waters. If I can, Marshall, if I can just tell a quick story real quick. When we finished our meeting last time, when I got home, it started to rain, and I keep my boat at my house, and I got a big Vepco light down on my dock. So I walked down to shut my door on, on the pilot house for my boat. And when I walked, I got an L-shaped pier, and when I walked by the light, I, looked, I heard this noise down in the water, like a clicking sound. And I looked down on top of the water, and it was 30 to 40 juvenile crabs about an inch long. But while I was standing there admiring this, a, a fish came up, I'm pretty sure it was a puppy drum, came up from under my dock, grabbed one of the juvenile crabs, and went back up under my dock. And, uh, you know, I know that's something, again, that happens thousands of times. I mean, everybody's dock around the, all the creeks that we have, you know. And uh, I really think that, that's the biggest problem we have on, with juvenile crab recruitment is, is predation. All right. Well, uh, Mr. before you mentioned, I, I hate people in the audience want to speak a bit. When should we? Um... Uh, it, it, it's it's up to you. I mean, I, again, tonight we'd like to try and at least come to consensus or some recommendations on what this committee. But if you want to take some public comment and get some input before crafting yeah. um, some things that are important to industry, it could be an appropriate time. We're, we're an yeah. hour into the meeting. Mr. Cox, I know he wants to say something. Uh, have then you, we'll do. Uh, we're looking. We're looking to increase, increase small crabs. Have you taken in consideration dark, dark coloration? Have you taken consideration? That's touchy subject in this country, but that's that's where our babies come from. They're orange, then they turn black and rub off. Have you taken consideration? You know, we've got the, the the black coloration law in effect now. Have you have you considered that extending that time frame? Well, there's you talk about saving in the spring. Saving the females in the spring, they ain't pregnant. You're talking about, I mean, they are, but they're not getting ready to have babies. And you're talking about shutting it down early, you know, earlier in the fall. They're still pregnant, but they're not getting ready to have no babies. They're having babies now. So if, if, you, if, you, want, if you want to have baby crabs, you've got to have the crabs when they're getting ready to have the babies, not in the spring when they're, they're still pregnant, but they're not busted as we call it and, so and i think that you took in consideration that I, I think that's something coloration. that's now now is when they're having the babies when they're black and, and i think that's something that we're looking for this committee if that's something they want to prioritize it's absolutely something we can look at there's where you get your babies from when they're when they're having the babies and not, that's something we can, we can look at something like that this fall but we will look for input from this committee this fall. about prioritizing so so you wouldn't you wouldn't be satisfied with the extending that time frame on keeping the black sponge right not at the moment because we don't have the analysis it's been two weeks since we met last we can't push that the the what do you mean we don't have the analysis they're having babies the so the commission meetings on the 28th mm -hmm. we can't turn around and just say 
change people's business plans or economic business plans and say, hey, we're going to move this. A lot of that season's okay. already happened. But it is something we can look at for 2023. Yeah, because I, I do think that, that there is, yeah, and that's the thing I think we've yeah. got to remind ourselves is that we kind of have limitations because we got a season that's been approved. It's what we're doing. We're traveling down the highway. We can adjust our speed, but we're going in this direction we've set out. We're not going to change direction. It's all about this. Yeah. So in, in the audience, to... uh, we're not going to come to some new conclusion about something. We're just going to vary our speed here. So essentially, I may be keeping it simple, but we're not going to reinvent the wheel tonight. I'll add that in order to get our regulations out for public comment in time for our June commission right. meeting, we have to have the regulations posted this coming Monday. So as soon as the committee makes their recommendations tonight, I'm then going and really quick, quick crafting a regulation. So, you know, we can definitely talk about new things um, to go into a place for next year Mr. or later down the line. Let's hear from the audience. I know Mr. Jenkins, I see him front and center here. You wanted to say something. And please introduce yourself um, before you speak so we can have that on record. I don't care of that, but I mean, I don't think Thank you, Mr. Tanner. Old Doug Jenkins, Sr., <laughs> Twin River Water Associate, that several of y'all brought up the presentation. And I've talked to Ron Liptus uh, during the past winter. And we were supposed to have a meeting, but we never met. I don't know what happened to him. I called him a couple of times, he never thanked him. But uh, I started watching, and JC brought it up late. light. And Chris Moore might remember it when I thought about the increase of the population of rockfish in the bay. We got millions and millions and millions more of them now than we had in yesterday's. And I got records going back to 1960 on my crab catches and on my rockfish catches. And back then you could harvest a 14 inch rockfish and we harvest them by the tons. And I got records to show that. Uh, JC mentioned about the pier. Well, I noticed that about 10 years ago. I had a pier on my dock to uh, go down that night and catch a few rockfish to eat. And they may have not been to the inch of what they're supposed to be, but they sure tasted good, and I didn't take over about two. That's all we needed. But under that light, it attracts minnows and small crabs. For some reason or other, the little crabs about this long that you mentioned back here was underneath there, I mean, loads of them. And there was loads of rockfish underneath that. And they were just sucking them up. Now, bay wide, it's thousands and thousands of piers with lights on. And we're not going to do anything to stop a, a property owner with a light on in this pier. But we can alert them and inform them when they're not down, because they leave the lights on uh, seven days a week all summer long, whether they're there or not, to alert them that that's taking uh, a lot of crabs out of the bay. Now, y'all may just, you know, you might not agree with that, but it's the truth. I asked Ron for to get some of his students or whatever and go down and document it. And maybe these people who squawking about $50 a pound crab meat could get after the governor because it's in the regulation with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries under that charter, if you got one, if you're having a problem with a, a, another species that is important to your state, then you can appeal to the uh, Secretary of Commerce and have something changed. And we need that in the Bay of Maryland and Virginia Bow. You talk about the, always on the water one, taking away from them, taking away from them. Well, the damn predators out there are taking away from majority of it, and we need to address that. But nobody has got to jump enough to go to the governor, uh, uh, and he's the one who has to contact the, uh, the Secretary of Commerce. So, uh, you know, 1993 was the highest region of, uh, of the Bay Register Ray. 
1995 was the rockfish completely recovered. In 1999 is when they start falling down, and that's when we had a lot of regulation about sanctuaries and dredging, <laughs> pot limits, taking crabbers out to the crab industry. Yeah. So, you know, we can stay here all night and talk about regulation. Yeah. Until you address the problem, it's not going to be solved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else from the audience? Come on up. State your name, if you would, and where you're from. My name's Jacob Jewell, and I'm from uh, Reedville, Virginia. I uh, have listened to all this and different comments. I was just shocked when no numbers, definite numbers, came up. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of limits and proposals here. We fill out harvest reports every month, year after year. We get the emails if we don't do them on time. Everybody does them. And I've heard, not to call you out, but both of y'all fumble around the numbers on what this is going to cut back the exact numbers because it doesn't look like five to ten percent to me it looks like a lot more um you know right when we enact these seasons and the bushel limits one or the other and then we keep talking about more to talk about in the fall it uh it scares me um my take on virginia is it's all geared around the part-time and retired watermen when we look at Carolina, and they can set all the pots they want. Maryland, you can have multiple licenses, 900 pots. And we've got 250 pots in a river is the most we can ever set. 425 in the bay, that's great. You can't make it like that. I don't know how the guys, I do have a 500-pot uh, license. I don't know how the guys are making it with the 255. We're not going to get into that tonight. But what you're doing is putting me out of business with a lot of these regulations. Um, you know, it making it impossible for a young man to work hard and make a good living out here. Everything I see happening is around the part-time and retired watermen. That's the only people that'll make it like this. Um, I'll be aging my license out next year if some of this happens. Which, well, I that's a different discussion and I, you say that's not an option right now. I mean, what, why isn't it um, to tackle some of these other issues? It seems like the first thing we went after was the season open and the bushel limits. I don't see how it would be that hard to, uh, you know, write a proposal to for no agents or some other things um, to go along. I'm not against the agent policy, but it's a lot better than what you're doing here. Um, this, I mean, it's putting me out of business. It really is. Or it's at least going to change my whole business model. I'm going to be your competition because I'm going to have to go into the retail side. Um, again, with the number thing, in November, we, not to call you out, but you just fumbled around the answer on what it's doing. You admitted that very few people crabbed in. I do. It's not that we're catching a lot of females, but the price is high. That's a huge month where I can actually make some money, just like in March. Sometimes, you know, I've got a 27 bushel limit. Sometimes we don't catch that in March, a lot of times. But the price is so high, it's all worth it. But we're going to cut me right out of business. Um, you know, just to harp on that again, if the numbers are low the last two weeks in November. Why are you cutting the people that are doing it? It's really, it's not making, it's a feel good, uh, you know, you're doing it just to feel good. It looks good on paper for the people in Richmond that apparently we're trying to, you know, appease. Another big part of this, not to uh, pit, you know, the 500 guys versus 300, this and that, but are we keeping the same reductions? Like right now, the 500 pot is getting reduced by 43%, and the 300 pot is getting reduced by 25%. Is that right? I mean, my math, that's right. How, how is that fair? You know, I mean, that, a man on the board told me, or, or I'm sorry, on the committee told me that 
they're going to keep pushing for what hurts the least amount of people. And that's exactly what, how I take that, is y'all are going to keep taking from the guys who have invested the most into this. 500 pot license right now is probably $50,000. People go out, probably get loans to buy that, buy the boat, have full-time crew. It's hard enough to find one person, but we might pay two since you're fishing more pots, and you're going to just keep taking from me. Um, and that's always been unfair for me. But now we're going to push that potentially right on to the end of June. I'm serious. I'm going to be leasing my license and, uh, you know, doing something else if this happens because it's impossible to work with. Um, going along with the numbers, like I said, I can't believe that y'all weren't up here. All right, if, you know, we've got harvest records and if we push it back till April 1st, that'll cut back 5% right there. How were no numbers presented in this? Um, and to play along with, I think we should have numbers on what type, when we'll get these options erased and go back to the status quo. You know, there needs to be data on, all right, at what point do we take action, at what point don't we? Um, you know, I, it's just amazing me, to me what kind of just took place. I sponge crab this past year. A lot of people, whatever, don't like it, did it. Didn't keep the black ones, everything's good. Personally, I would trade no sponge crabbing at all if we didn't have this. Sponge crabs are cheap, historically. Is that an option? And I'm not here to ruffle feathers. If it was ever an option, it should be a vote for the guys that actually go sponge crabbing, not the general crabbing population, because everybody would say, oh yeah, cut out sponging, because it's not affecting them. But a lot of guys, it does affect. But those guys that go sponging, typically, I would say, are going to be hurt by this even more, because they're down the bay, they're the big boats, and this is where you make money in March and April and in November especially the last two weeks. Uh, I just hope y'all reconsider a lot of this because, you know, a young man trying to make a living is not going to be able to do it with these current trends. All right. Adam? Uh, a couple of things in, in response. To, he, he hit on a, a lot of things there. When you just to clarify, when you look at those options on the board, I will throw out those percentages because when you start hearing things like 42, it really skews the way we're viewing some of this. Those green options, they only represent about a 5% harvest reduction, but it depends on what year you look at. We didn't just look at one year and say, let's reduce from this year. We looked at the last 18, 19, 20, and 21, as well as the average across four, those years as well. So when you look at those greens, depending on the year or the average you're looking at, it's about 5%. When you look at that orange one, it's about 7%. And you can step that right up to the red one, it's around 10%. But it depends on harvest, it depends on the year. Um, so that, that's one thing that I wanted to throw out there. And the reason we didn't throw it out is because when you start throwing out those numbers, Everyone is across all jurisdictions. It's all trying to get to that magic number when we can all agree that there are things that we can do to this fishery that might not have a percentage that may have more impact on the abundance. But as soon as we are publicly trying to get to 10, it may throw out a lot of those things that don't come up with a magic number. One of the other things that he hit on was agents. Agents is something that we brought to this committee twice, we spent two full meetings on this. The recommendation that came out of this committee is that we are wasting our time and we don't want to talk about it for two years. That was the recommendation from this committee on agents. So now we are sitting in that same spot where agents is coming back around. So it's not something that we have not looked at and it's not something that we have not tried to address is we cannot come to a consensus through our industry and representation to be able to to find a better business plan or find a better method. Um, one of the other things he touched on that, that I've been really high on looking through there is, he didn't say bushel standardization, but when he is looking at the 
difference between the high bushel limits and the low bushel limits. The 85 pot license only takes about a 20% cut when you go down. And the 455 pot takes about a 43% when you go down. Those things are not equitable. The ones in the middle are about a 30%. Why, why the, way, the way we got there is because when we went through harvest reductions, the 455 catch more. So we, st we created an industry standard in 2012, the industry standard was that about every 10 pots I catch, I, I fish, I'm gonna catch a bushel. That's what we established, that's how we got to those bushel limits. And then from there, because of the surveys in 2012 as a committee, we decided that wasn't enough. So that's where we started changing these things to get to what we're gonna call that magic number. And that's what we're trying not to do this time, is get to that magic number. So bushel standardization is something we have talked about as staff, but going to the commission, going to the other jurisdictions and say, this is the all time lowest winter dredge survey, we'd like to increase the number of bushels people can take, may not be the most appropriate time to do this with the abundance. So I just wanted to touch on those three things during public because I seemed really important from the public, so. Yes, no, thank you. I, I appreciate your history on it as well. Thank you so much. Is, Mr. Is, Diggs. Is the 255 the most popular license? Yes. So why don't they, I mean, so a reduction on them would give you more percentage than the other guys. I mean, I don't understand why they're, what are they just considered better crabbers than the guy with the big pots? I mean, that's, that's and then you're gonna take the guy with the big rig who's probably a full-timer and cut him more percentage throughout the whole year. All these rules are geared only at the full-time guys and the big rigs. Nothing is being done to the smaller rigs. I mean, it's like we're just trying to kill the industry from the top. And if these are important to the committee and they want to prioritize it and they want to have influence over 2023 and 2024, these are the things that we need to dig through in the fall so that what we want to happen in the fishery and what we think is right across industry is what what's happening. So I, I, I don't want to say I don't hear you because it's something I've looked at quite a bit. Um, but it might not be the right timing, but we need to talk about it so when the timing is right, we are doing things that we think are the right things to do versus maybe, maybe affecting different pot categories different. Sure. Yes, sir. Gerald Parks, Gloucester, Virginia, commercial fisherman. Have been crabbing actively since 1984. I agree with Mr. Diggs, and I agree with this gentleman here. I participated in an invasion species program with VIMS with George Trice from the coast. We electrocuted the catfish. 10,000, 13,000 pounds of catfish in less than two hours. Four men dipping with hand nets. We had VIMS come out with us and he'd done a gut content. You'd be amazed at how many crabs, how many American eels, perch. And this is in the James River from Chickahominy clean up to the falls. We couldn't go any farther because we couldn't get above the rocks. We also done it in the York River from Sweet Hall clean up to almost the 301 bridge. We're talking catfish from this size to, we caught them as high as 96 pounds. Look like torpedoes. I've also hauled Satan. Ken, he, he's familiar with the area around what we call backway shore, around the coast. Couldn't hardly get the nets to the shore for the pucketail drum. Little crabs scattering off of the nets, all juveniles. The next way to week, go back and haul the same area, don't see them, don't see the, don't see the puppy tail. Why? Because they moved on, and the puppy tail has moved on with them. Got to do something about the predators. Got to open it up. Got to eliminate the rock. Got to eliminate the catfish. Got to eliminate the red drum. If we don't, we're not going to have a species. All these laws, 18 years worth. Do away with winter crab drudgery. Going to bring back the crabs. Where are they at? Where are they at? Don't put no more laws on us. We don't need no more laws. None of it. Leave it alone. Let's see what happens. You want to do something, open up crab drudging. Let us cultivate the bottom. Let's try it for five years, see what happens. There's more crabs then. What's that, Ken? It was a 
lot more crabs and fish when we when we were crab dredging. I agree, 100 percent. Reduction in gear. I haven't put a crab pot in the water the whole year. It's not feasible. You see them all over the docks. People can't do it. $30 for bait, $6 for gas. You're catching seven, eight, ten baskets of crabs a day. Can't do it. Crab pot, $60 rigged up in the water. Gentlemen that do it, you don't know. You can't afford it. But something does have to be done. And it needs to start, and it needs to start soon. But as of right now, I would hope this board wouldn't put any more laws on us. We're, over, we're overburdened with laws. And none of them's done any good. We're in the same place we were before with 18 years worth of laws. I hope y'all take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Is there anyone else? How you doing? Uh, my name is Daryl Hurley. Uh, I got Hurley Seafood on the Eastern Shore, and uh, uh, I buy crabs from Georgia all the way up to Cape May, and uh, I just feel like, you know, we have the biggest laws on us more than any state there is. Um, I mean, just north of us, they've got no pot limit, no time limit. They're crab dredging all fall or all winter um, below us. I just feel like if we don't do something about the fish, the uh, rockfish, the drum, uh, bullfish, Kobe, everything, we're just, I mean, just ate up with it. And uh, in, in reference to this, um, you know, all, all it's doing is, is kind <clears> of <throat> cutting out the money uh, of when it's the time to be made. Um, a lot of times over on our side, we can catch crabs end of February, 1st of March. Um, we got high salinity, little crabs, but they're worth money then. You catch it in the middle of March, 1st of April, they're worth about the quarter amount that they were worth then. Um, and uh, same thing with the fall. I mean, a lot of these guys wait and some of the best money they made in the fall was end of November, middle of December. Um, and, you know, they're, they're crabbing cheap October, November, beginning of it. And you, just as soon as they go to make any money, you're, you're you know, saying stop. So it's just, uh, I just think if we don't do something with the fish, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do it, you know, have anything, but, so. All right. Thank you, Ms. Shirley. Anyone else? Adam, you have any follow-up at all? <clears throat> I, I think one thing through those public comments that I heard was important was that end of November season. And it is when Chris brought it up, being able to manipulate um, or change these dates you see on the board is something that staff can do on the fly. So if that if the committee feels that the end of November is important, there's a trade-off for everything. So yes, we can stay open till the end of November, but those reduced bushel limits would have to move. I think Chris brought up October 1st. I think that falls into that 5% range, if that's something the committee, if the committee doesn't want to look at the fall, they think it's more important to reduce that harvest in the spring rather than that October 16th date you see on there, that's something we can look at as well. But we do need some, we're looking for guidance. We're looking for what's important <clears throat> to this committee so we can just, so we can craft those recommendations to the commission. Do they have an option for what it would take to keep it open all year? Do I'm sorry? Do y'all have a little thing up here, a color for all the whole season? Keeping the whole season? Yeah, I mean, with push the limits, like, do y'all have, like, I see where you got it, where with no long-term changes, but I'm saying, do you have, like, what? What will we be talk, dealing with if you kept it open? Do you all have a proposal? If we kept it open until November 30th? Yes, sir. So I think the one Chris brought up would be moving that reduced bushel limit back to October 1st. So what would that be dealing with option A here? E either one you want to look at. We can call it, we can call option whatever, but it, it would essentially <coughs> move that November 15th closure date back down to the November 30th, which everyone seems to think that's pretty important but it would take that reduced bushel limit and instead of having 
um, those high bushel limits in the summer till October 16th, we would only have them till November till October 1st. And that, that's equivalent to what you are looking at in green. But if you would rather, instead of that, April 30th day, May 15th, we, we can look at that as well. But we need some guidance where those two weeks, and it might be three weeks, I don't know how many weeks it'll be when we, when we start looking at that, but that, those time ranges, what's important when the season's good, when you're getting good prices for those crabs is, is the input we that we would like. I mean, the two weeks in May, would you get more savings out of two weeks in May than you're going to get out of doing the bushel limits for two weeks in October or November when it's less people crabbing and then more people harvesting in the springtime than it is in the fall? Sure. So she's throwing up some bushel limits in the some springtime. Lives. Wouldn't, they, wouldn't that accomplish more than... I mean, it can't be that many people in the fall crabbing. If so, I just don't it's know not. where they're hiding. They're really good at hiding. That's all I can say. I mean, so th there's an option E right there. I, I think that's if we wanted to stay open to the end of November, that it, that is something that the staff thinks thinks is reasonable. But there is a trade-off to try and get to that around that five percent, and then we can look at other <coughs> conservation measures through these through the fall to make up some of that rest. Would would E be with long-term changes? No, E okay. E would be green. Okay. It would be green. Well, uh, it's I'm just looking at <coughs> compared to D. Um, uh, they got an extra 15 days on in November, which is good. Uh, low bushel limits begin the same time, first October. Uh, a little change in the low bushel ends. D stands for devastation. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing about E as compared to D and C for that matter is it requires that the commission, not us, it's the commission that does it, we only recommend, comes up with some other measures this fall to deal with, to make change, significant changes next year. And they gave us a list of things that they were talking about, but crap. it's something we have to work what through if, later. What if a study I, I, plenty of crabs this winter, then you don't have to make changes. So the, the, the advisory committees in the other jurisdictions don't believe that 5% is enough to make a significant conservation effort for these. So 5% is a starting point. And Tom is right. We, we do need to come back in the fall and look at some of these other options that aren't cutting season, that aren't cutting bushel limits, that we inherently know have signed come some kind of abundant savings. Can we put a number on those? Maybe not. But if we know that, that there is some kind of savings in there and we are coming up with those conservation things, we know it's good for the population. We don't have to get to that 10%. We need to get to that five plus these genuine conservation measures. So, so they hang on, hang on, Did they, you, get Mr. Burns. I just have a question. How can you justify taking 42% from us and Maryland gave up, what, three baskets, two baskets, and it's supposed to be like an equal trade-off in the Bay? I'm sorry. 42% What do you mean about 42%? 425 license, it's a 42% reduction. Like they said, in Maryland, they're giving up, what, three bushels of males and maybe <coughs> two weeks in August or something? No, like, couple, how, it just doesn't seem like they're really giving up put, anything. The proposal I've seen from Maryland, it looked like to me they're losing a couple bushels here and we're getting a couple days here and there. The we're band just band doing like we do. We're just feeding the, fish and taking all the rules. The, fish, the fisheries are very different from Maryland to Virginia. Well, the number of crabbers they have out there crabbing, they have a lot more out there. The number of pots they have traps too. is a lot more. The, their male-female composition in those time, times of years are very different. So I, I hear what you're saying, that when you I compare just, just bushels, well, but the, the fisheries number of people are, are very different. They're not necessarily apples and oranges that we're comparing here. Nobody with a big license is going to give up 42%. Okay. that's going to be okay with that. Let's, okay, but I hear you on that, but I think we got to stick with what, what yeah, we got I mean, up there on the board. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, hey, uh, go ahead, Mr. Cox. Okay, we have a quorum. Staff, there's two options. This is what this paper says. You have two options on here. Option A will require two more weeks of the low bushel limit in spring. Option B will require two more weeks of the low bushel limit in the fall. That's what you were going to present to us and to Ben Marcy. Is that correct? 
That, that's right, what so, we presented to you. So what I'm fixing to do is, you know, we can sit here all night and talk about this. What I'm fixing to do is I'm going to make a motion. And that way we see just how this board feels. So we'll, we'll find out what options that we like or what we don't like and where we go from there. I'm going to make a motion that we approve option A, two more weeks of low bushel limit in the spring. Motion's been made. And that also includes a two-week closure starting November 15th. Yes. Motion's been made. We'll see how the board feels. All right. Is there uh, any discussion on the motion? Let me, look, can I, I, I want to ask a process question. Marshall, are, are you planning to, to go through all of these? No, I'm going through A and B. That way, at least we'll know if this board is willing to do anything at all. We can sit here all night long until we, yeah. until I find out whether this board is willing to do anything. Oh, well, oh well, then I'll make a motion. If, is this board going to, going to pres present anything to him? Okay, I, I was just, I wanted to figure out exactly. That's where yeah. I'm going. Because we can sit here all night. I've done this for years and years. And so let's find out how the board feels first. And then he'll know how we feel, whether we're just wasting that time on these. On these. Mm -hmm. Motion's been made, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, I hear you. Is there a I'm, second to the motion? No, I mean, I, I, I'm really in favor of, of E. I, I think E's a butter. Well, we'll come, we'll, we'll we, we've got motions on the table right now. Hang on. We, we can have discussion on the motion yeah. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so and that's what we're going to do. Does anybody have any thoughts on Mr. Dick? I mean, I, me, I agree that me that personally, is I only reason I, I don't like any of them. Right. I don't, I don't agree with any of them. But I, I we're going to do something. That's going to happen. Even if we don't do something, they're going to do something. That's, it's, yep. we can sit here and argue about it. We can talk about it. All that's going to make them happy. Only thing I'm saying is I like, I just don't like taking us out of the industry of any time. I don't like shutting the fishery down for any point in time it's never good for a business which i mean i guess supply chain issues now are normal but it's never good for your business when you take it just like when we lost crab drudging and stuff it hurts to take you out of a i said it they, would never open again in my lifetime oh you were right and when you call back to these places you know, like virginia who you know they've been doing business with these guys in the winter i just i don't like to see us shut the industry you know i mean it's retail businesses it's the 7-elevens that people get it's not it's more to it than just the crab you know, I just don't like seeing us ever shut our fishery down. I just, I really don't, I have, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with any of it because I don't know that it's going to do anything. I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying I agree, but I'm just saying if, I would, I would just lean towards keeping the fishery open end to end. That's <clears throat> the only reason I support E. You support E, you said. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I said, I'm not losing anything. Was yeah. Yes, yeah, well, he's, we're, this is our okay. discussion part. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Ken. I, I, my, I mean, my whole opinion of it, I think we jump in the gun for anything. I think we ought to wait at least to the end of the year, season's over, then go from in. Give us more time to think about it instead of hurting everybody. I think we need to regroup and think about it a little bit more. I mean, we jump in awful quick here. We, we knew about a month ago. And now you want to take somebody's livelihood for the – yeah, I, I think you need to step back and think about it a little bit longer and see what we can do besides that. So, well, can take place anyway. anything else we do wouldn't take into effect. Hey, 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 uh, well, well, with E, I mean, Ernie, we're, we're, we're only taking low bushel. Uh, hmm? With option E, the only thing you're losing is the low bushel uh, limits. Yeah, but you're losing it from March 15th until. Uh, no? Oh, March 31st. Yeah. No, that's March 17th. No, May 15th. Yeah. You're losing two and a half, three months. Two months. That's a whole season. That's a whole season. That's when crabs are the highest. Okay, hang on. Is it, did you want it down there? Anyone else? Here. I, 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 I agree with Joe Paul. Uh, Ernie, I think we need to sit back and just see what happens. That's not and I also think we ought to have some meetings just dealing with the predation of all the stuff because that's the real problem in my opinion. It has been since 1989 or 79 when they started turning all these catfish loose. And it's just going to get worse. Okay. All, right. all right, so we still have a motion. Yeah, maybe a, a, a question for staff. So E is kind of a combination of A and B. Mm -hmm. 
B is a 30, is an April 30 cutoff? Yes. Could staff look at that option as instead of a April, instead of a May 15th, low bushel in and April 30th and see what the difference is? Is that, is that yeah. reasonable? That, that's reasonable. Uh, again, we don't want to throw out 100 options because be looking at 100, uh, yeah. but so it is something we can look at. What's that? Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Right um, I mean, historically, this agency before probably everybody who's on staff more or less now got here would would advertise multiple options in the public notice which is what you have to do by Monday which is what which is what we did we did we did advertise <coughs> adjusting bushel limits and seasons to give the Commission maximum flexibility okay for, for and so what you have to do by Monday is draft the regulation to submit Correct. to we need to submit a draft regulation so okay. the public is aware of what we are proposing. can you submit two draft regulations no we cannot so historically they never published the draft regulations on the web page that's a new thing is that because of a multiple, change in law? multiple draft regulations yeah why not on the web page? I, I, I don't. I don't believe we can. I don't believe we can do that. Yeah, they never. They historically never posted the the regulations. It was only the public notice. Yeah, um, um, this is Pat. I mean, what would happen is we would put in a recommendation in our regulation. If the commission wanted to do something else, they have that option of doing it. If it's within the realm of what we're discussing, so. If, if we propose something and they, they want to tweak it a little bit, they have the authority to do that. Yeah. So, so I mean, but, but we don't we don't provide them with like, you know, it, it's not like ASMC and the council where they, you know, give you umpteen million uh, options. We we go to them with a single, you know, a single recommendation. You know, we can show some options if they want that, and then they can discuss it. But. Um, the regulation that we write will have one thing in it, and then if it's changed, it will be changed accordingly before it goes to the registrar. That, right. But what I'm saying is, and this especially is true with recreational fisheries, when you made changes to size limits and bag limits, the commission would, or staff would advertise three different options for staff for bag and size limits. And it would make it all the way to the commission meeting, and then at the commission meeting, it would be decided which one went into regulation. And up until then, there wasn't a regulation written up that said this. And oftentimes, staff would say these all these options are are equivalent. Any one of them are fine with us. There's there's always been a draft regulation posted. We haven't always had internet capabilities before it was posted on internet. It was available by law here, posted at the agency for anyone to view. Uh, as technology has gotten, we have found other ways to be able to push that information out. But there is always one draft regulation. Can we bring multiple things for the commission to be able to make decisions on? Uh, generally, yeah. we bring one thing, but we do have other things because the commission has thoughts and opinions. They do pick up things through public comment. So we do have other things available as we, we think that they might be interested in. But yes, there's always been one draft regulation posted. All right, so we have a motion, and uh, I want to see, is there a second out there? All right, there's no second to the motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll withdraw that motion. All right. And I'll make another motion. See how this one rolls. My motion is that we do nothing. We do not support staff's presentation to two options we, we don't do anything we don't do anything. We don't do anything that, that's my motion we're going nowhere my recommend my motion is no, that we that we do nothing until we have further meetings and discuss presentation and other problems that we all feel is that was a problem and I'll second it so we got a second to a motion of doing doing nothing all right any any uh, discussion on that before we call the motion. If, if we go and do nothing, are they still going to hit us with something? I just don't believe that yes, they're going to accept yes, nothing. Yes. I do not I'm believe sure that they're going to. And if you put let them do it, it's not going to. Yes. I don't know. I just, I just Chairman. feel like you're going to have. If you turn it over to them, it's going to be worse than if we got if you go out. with this. I, I don't know. We got on their feet, not mine. We Mr. Chairman, it's fine to speak your mind. That's what we're here for. I, I'm, I don't want anybody not to. Not to uh, I mean, that's Mr. why they're there. Let, them, let it be on them. Yes, sir, Mr. Powers. I don't think I would we like to make a substitute motion. Substitute motion. 
Okay. I would a substitute motion for for item E. Mm. Would, would the maker Which the is motion? the one they put in because of discussion in this meeting where we said that the people who are full-time watermen with the big rigs, which are really, who wouldn't benefit from it, would get the, um, would get the last two weeks of the season, and I'd get good crab meat before Bill for seafood. You're going to have to explain that. And, um, and it does reduce the bushel limit starting on October 1st, but that's the payback for doing that. I would, I would second it because I mean if they're going to do something I just think the season needs to be over. Okay. Well, I, t I tell you what, let's the maker of the motion does not agree with the substitute motion. So, let's call he this He doesn't have to. No, that, that's he, not pardon that, me. that's an amendment that gets an agreement, a substitute motion wins or not on the second. Okay, so you need a second. I'm sorry. I have I'm, one. I'm, he just did. Oh, he so got he uh, thank you fellas. So okay. The, yes, Very the sub does Tom substitute the motion. Well, okay. He seconded it, so, well, we need, so the amended not? motion becomes the main motion. Well, we okay. need, we need to right. hear that. We need to hear. Thank you. We need that read out. That's E, right? Is what you're saying? Yeah. Tom, need, clarification: You are supporting. I'm supporting E, I'm supporting is. E which is attention. season opens on March 17th, low bushel limit ends on May 15th. That has the advantage, I believe, from meeting from last time, of keeping the big rigs from Maryland or for. for discouraging the big rigs from Maryland from coming down so much and um, the low bushel limit begins on October 1st as the payback for keeping the season open till November 30th and as, as a caveat to that motion as, as said we're doing these things on the fly depending on the year there are some there's one year where that gets you up to about six most years are like 3.9 something around around four but I mean, so if we're the, looking. If we're the looking. Survey we're, comes back with crabs this mm -hmm. year. Can't we redo something for so next year? I think I, I throw that out to to say that there are other things with abundance that we will need to look at this fall, regardless right. of which right. of those options we're going to. So this fall, we're going to look at other long-term changes, and in addition to that, because we have online reporting for crabs now, you'll know on September first. Well, September fifteenth, maybe what was done through at least the 1st of August, certainly by, or certainly the 1st of August, maybe the end of August. Minus delinquent reporting. Minus delinquent reporting. So you'll at least be able to go, oh my goodness, it was horrible this spring, and because of economic reasons or whatever, the catch was down, effort was down. We may already have a big reduction. Yeah, and, and we've already had a big reduction this year, so we could, we don't have to do so much next year or we can actually up this bushel limit a little bit on the fly. Okay. All right. So we have a motion we'll and a second. Discussion. And should we do? Uh, we'll call the question. Oh, I think we can have discussion, though, right? Discussion. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm, thank you. <laughs> I want to ask a, maybe a, sure. Mark. I know we talked about the Cape Charles issue after the last meeting. Yeah. And there was some interest in having the lower bushel limits through April. Yes and no. But then, you know, to be honest with you, I got thinking about that. If, if, Delaware comes off or another state comes off, then it's really going to hurt Virginia crabbers because we're limited with the ability to sell of our crabs at, well, a lower bushel limit. I mean. They're still going to come. Yeah, they're, st they're still going to come. I don't, I don't think it has any effect, honestly. But I think some of those long-term options will help address that. Yeah, well, that's what we need to look at. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm okay with, with with E. With E, okay. As it stands. As it stands now. Okay. But I think right now, don't we have a trawl survey going on? Or not? The VIMS. VIMS trawl survey. VIMS summer juveniles trawl. Yes. E, what does that start? I don't know the exact dates it runs, but yes, it does run through the summer. Okay, Forget so you're doing that now. The, the trawl survey goes every month. Uh, we used, we looked at the data last year, the juveniles, the juveniles were low. They weren't the lowest ever, but Rob, Rob said that the adult female stock looked really bad in you know last summer. So, uh, but we'll get those numbers um, September, I think. September last, or October. Last year, I think it was October, November, because yeah. the, the committee had wanted to see those numbers to discuss uh, season extension. But we yep. wouldn't have been able. We wouldn't have had those numbers in time to so, affect an extension. Yeah. So, anyways, so there's a possibility we could see the trawl survey come back, and there's going to be good numbers. It's a possibility. Will it happen? We don't know. So, 
uh, for for me, E right now would work, but if if the trial survey comes back and it looks good, then I think we should, you know, maybe change the date from May fifteenth to April thirtieth. Right, and and, you, and and I think Adam, you said you would go back and look at possibly what difference we get between April thirtieth and May fifteenth, right? You said you'd that look. that specific time frame. Yeah, yeah. you said I, I think you all agreed we'll to do that, that, right? I mean, if the trial survey looks good, y'all could extend it two weeks into December. We keep your season going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right. We'll call the question. All in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Sir. For which one? For E. e. What is that? Is that uh, Adam? Can you count? I had seven. Seven. Six. Seven. 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 Four. All right. And all against? Raise your hand. Okay. Any abstentions? No. Okay. All right. All right. So, switching switching gears a little bit is it's late we plan on doing this meeting till seven so uh and and the light of time one of the other questions we're going to ask this committee is we're going to come back here in august we're going to come back here in september we're going to have a few meetings to the fall to try and guide this fishery in, in the ways we see fit these are some of the things that we discussed last meeting that the committee wanted to talk about i don't have what percent savings they are that analysis is being done. Rom and the VIM staff is helping parse through that. They won't, didn't have it done in two weeks. It wasn't a reasonable timeline. But we can look at it in August and September and put these in for 2023. We wanted to ask the committee, could they prioritize these in which ones they were most interested in looking at that we could bring first in August, September, and which ones they was off the table and they didn't want to consider at all? rather than us bringing you something that this committee or the industry feels is not important for this fishery. So we're looking for some guidance, some open discussion, realizing that it, it's late in the meeting for some open discussion. And what I can do um, with the committee's agreement is I can edit this list live. So if you think something should be at the top of the list, I can move it to the top of the list. You want something at the bottom of the list, I can move it to the bottom of the list. That way you can get a good look at what your priorities are, and that helps shape where we put our efforts for those fall discussions. This won't set you in stone. This is just helping guide us. Good one on top right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. I that's mean, true. everyone thinks agents is going to fix the Marylanders coming down, correct? Uh, that that that's, the, that's no. I think the agents are sore subject. It was last time, couldn't get nowhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Leave it there, I guess. Don't I say don't it's illegal. I don't agree with it, but it's never going to go. It's a bit of a tough process. Uh, so why don't we why don't we uh, why don't we do something like um, how many people like agents right now as the number one priority to work on? Raise your hand. It's, it's seven. Seven. Okay. This seems pretty. This seems pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chairman. I, yes, sir. On the last item where you say increase peel or minimum size limit. I think that that should be coupled, like they did at Potomac Rivers, <coughs> with increasing a minor amount, the, um, the adult or the male crab size limit. From five yeah. inches? From five to five and a quarter or something. Uh, Potomac Rivers has done something like this. And the real key with yeah. this, guys, that you got to think about is a certain fraction of the crabs, say between five and five and a quarter inches. If you let them molt one more time, that's going to be a six inch crab, six and a half inch crab. That is a much better quality product. Um, and that's what Johnny was talking about, and he's not here tonight. And we, we can get into the weeds about what Yeah, get what, into the, the weeds of that, but, we bring, but, but when you really talk like about increasing the peeler minimum, you have to couple <clears throat> that with increase the uh, minimum size on uh, Jimmy Crabs. If the, if the committee prioritizes looking at size limits, yeah. that's something that we can bring down. Mr. Sanford, I know he says. The uh, peeler fishery, percentage-wise, what, I mean, what percentage of peeler potters now? Isn't it like a, like 3% of the 
of the overall catch. Yeah, three percent. So, to me, that's another one of those. This pillar that shouldn't be on. That's not hurt. Like that. That's yeah. not hurt. Right, so we'll keep that at the bottom. Yeah. Let's, uh, so we're agents is still number one. What would be number two? Anybody got a number two? That, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, sir. Adam, uh, sanctuary. Are you looking at moving the line or moving the date? What we've looked, we've looked at it, Rom, preliminarily, and we're looking at moving some of those lines, creating more of a streamlined corridor. I think mm -hmm. what we talked about last last week, last two weeks, was um, mm -hmm. trying to relieve some of the pressure mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. those estuaries. So mm -hmm. uh, that's something we're looking at, is yeah. shrinking the sanctuary to still maintain that corridor, mm -hmm. but relieve some of the pressure in the tributaries. What we're doing right now is looking for, using the surveys to look for hotspots, mm -hmm. and making sure we maintain the sanctuary around those hotspots, mm -hmm. and find sort of the low, um, Places where there's still crabs, mm -hmm. but fewer of those mature females mm -hmm. to um, maybe cut those areas out. Mm -hmm. And again, that's one of those things that we may know is inherently good for the fishery, not mm -hmm. to have so much scrunched up in those tributaries, yeah. but may not get us to a 10%. And that's why putting mm -hmm. those percentage numbers mm -hmm. on it is not necessarily the, w the way the committee might want to go. No. Mr. Mr. Burns, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but if you increase the male size limit in Virginia, you're going to ruin us. We don't get big crabs here in Lake Louisiana. It's salty water. It's not, it's not fresh. It's not brackish. You're never going to have a big crab. Or they get big body a little too. Go to, go to Seaside. It's a pot full of 50 jimmies that aren't legal now. Their body's huge with no points. You just throw it over every day for nothing. Can't sell it. It's just there. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. now, I would put sanctuary here. number two. Sanctuary, sanctuary is number two. Okay. Yeah, I mean, would y'all agree with that? Yeah. How many hands up Everybody for sanctuary is number two? You know, you know, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Nixon. Farting around with this stuff so long. When when Rom first came out with this idea of these sanctuaries. He presented it to the legislature, which they used to have the old Chesapeake and Tribs Committee. And I lobbied up there for 30 years. We're all sitting in a committee room waiting for the meeting to start, and Rom comes in and he says, I'm going to show this to this committee, and this is what my proposal is. And and I, I looked right at him. I said, Rom, I said, what you're going to do is you're going to take what you think is a problem, and you're going to move it and create another problem by putting all this pressure in the estuaries mm -hmm. and I've talked about this for how many years and Good. I almost fell out of my chair the other night when he said something about yes. he wanted to adjust the sanctuaries I'm thinking yeah well now that this whole thing's about to collapse you come up with the idea you want to do this. that that's an important thing um, one thing that, I, that, it, that it needs to be coupled with, and this is going go on down the line with this with this sponge crab dates. Are you talking about the black sponge dates? Um, we had a customer come to us in Norfolk the other day, and she said that uh, she had come over here with her kids to go to the beach, and uh, the kids couldn't swim in the water because there were so many crabs up on shore. They were getting run out of the water. And I called somebody that I knew that crabs over this way. I said, you know, you, you crab over here. I said, what's the situation over there? Well, the sponges got so black, we all had to leave. So where do they go? They go right on up the river. And I talked to Jack Travelstead about this years ago. And I said, Jack, I said, this black sponge stuff is no good. You know, we've adjusted the dates on it. We've talked about, you know, survival rates after they've been handled and in pots and this, that, and the other. And the little bit has been shrunk down to you know, whatever it is. And I said, I know what you're doing. I said, you really don't care about the black sponges. You just want to get everybody to move off the sponge crabs, period. But it puts more pressure up in, in the estuaries. And all this effort we've put out so far this evening has been all about saving female crabs. But the male crabs have just been fished to death. And what about the shedded females that you catch up there? That yeah, and they're all they're all like crabs. You know, um, this has to be a consideration of protecting some of the male crabs. Um, one one suggestion that that has been brought up before, and it hasn't been it, it hasn't been talked about at all this year, and that is some. Some I know people will hate to hear this. I don't like the sound of it either, but I don't know what there's got to be some point 
stop in the upper end of these estuaries where you don't go either. Uh, I was going to a meeting several years ago when we still met over Newport News, and I guess, what is it, Newmarket Creek that's over there around Military Circle? I mean, uh, the, uh, Coliseum, the mall so and the, the Coliseum or whatever. It's and there's, there's crab pots in that little ditch over there by the <laughs> interstate. And I'm thinking, what in the world? How far up does somebody have to go, you know? Uh, there's got to be a line drawn somewhere, you know, I, I know where they would be in my end of the world, where, where you just don't go and let, let, let the crabs be, at least until a certain date in, in the fall. Let all this mating and stuff go on. Um, the, the mating is just as important as the spawning is, to me. Because you know I've seen seen what if it ain't what happens. Crabs to swim back out the river, it ain't going to be none to spawn in the bay. Right. So I would I would like to see that addressed somewhere along the line between now and the fall. <laughs> the the other thing with these transfers has to go along with the agents. What you're going to see is some of the people that are going to try to find the loophole in this agent stuff. They're going to try to assign a license. To their to whoever's their agent and just transfer it to them. And I, I brought this up years ago to Jack. I said, if if we want to get rid of these agents, or or we also had a lot of problem with people churning licenses. They were buying a license and then they were turning around and reselling it. Mm -hmm. You need to put a time limit on how how long the it. minimum requirement is for you to hold that license before you can transfer it again. And my idea was five. somewhere between three and five years. So if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a license or if you're gonna give it to somebody to transfer, you're not gonna get that thing back for three to five years, whatever somebody wants to come up with. That'll that'll stop all of that. Yeah. So Mr. Nixon, uh, if you were gonna go with a third one, it, would you be tra transfers or sponge crabs? I I heard you mention the two different things. There. Well, I'd I'd be, I'd be concerned with with the transfers being right up there with with the. Uh, with, with the age you'd like to make that number three I, I, I think I think what he's saying is that trans agents should be agents and transfers not not a separate item not two separate items or at least one and two something like yeah that. They, and, and again and this this isn't set in stone this okay is, this is letting us know what's important to you so uh, right. when we or, talk about well, this some parts really, of this some parts of the Commonwealth is not much of a problem <laughs> In the urban area where I am, it's it, it gets insane. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. throw anybody we're, in there. We're not planning on cutting off after a certain number of these items. So, <coughs> you know, all we're looking for is that relative priority. Okay. Now, I'll bring up that last meeting, there was a lot of concern about people who were setting too many pots. So, how do we how do we rate pot tagging? Pot -tagging? Should that it, still be the up there? Leave it where it's at. Uh, yeah, and let me, can I ask a question about that? Mr. Moore, we used to do so many. Uh, being that we talked a lot about that last meeting, I've been thinking about that a lot. And also, I don't think it changes on this table, but, um, you know, when we have talked about pot tagging, we've talked about it a lot, we have generally talked about it in having the watermen pay for it. And if we could get the General Assembly to pay for it at least for two, three, four years, would that make pot tagging more going to do about the loss. I mean, some guys come down the bay. I mean, we crab in Tugboat Alley. You go to crab off, you lose 18, 20 pots a night. I mean, how are you going to get your tags uh, back? Right. And, and all in Hampton Roads. It's not that's like, really, you know, we, 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 um, some places you can go and you won't lose three <coughs> pots a year, problem. but you might not make any money, but you'll keep your pots. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I that, think to that point. Some, yeah, so, that, so again, this isn't I mean, saying the, the how we're going to do it. you live in, I mean, some some guys will go through two, 300 pots a year and other guys might lose so, and that would be part of part of the discussion. So go find go find Jack Travelsteads or Rob O'Reilly's notes because we figured all this out about five years ago, five years ago. and it didn't get funded ten years ago or something. Yeah. What, well, what do you think pot tagging is going to fix? You got a buoy with a number on it now. What's the tag going to do? What the tag's going to do is is, well, the, is limit somebody to no more than ten percent above what they're supposed to have. Are you going to go count them? Where are these guys? Just, actually well, that that's the idea is we give you as many. Nobody counts them now. We give you as many tags as you're supposed to have, and if there's a buoy that's not tagged, then it's in a legal pot. 
And is the uh, idea. So they don't have to count. They just know this a, pot doesn't have a legal. We talked about this years and years ago. I don't like you. We got a tag. I'll just clip your damn tag off and please come by and take your pot. And that, that all, on, again, man. all part of the discussion. We've done this years ago. <laughs> not, not in set in stone. Just how, how do we order these discussions? Okay. All right. All right. And maybe for that discussion, PRFC does operate a pot tagging program. Do they lose pots <clears> in the Potomac River like you lose? Yeah. In the main stem of the bay or in Hampton I, I talk, I, I, I talk I briefly. I'm just, I mean, it's, it's nasty. I mean, I've seen, mm -hmm. there was, when the tugboats come through, we were all crabbing off there. You'd see knots of 20 pots just it. all wrapped together. I mean, you. I find them all to my ass. So I think we have some good guidance on some of the top priorities and some things that are low priority. So that, that, that is good guidance. So that, that's exactly what we're looking for, not necessarily solve them, but what, what we bring next. And I, I think the next step for this committee would be setting up something, not doing anything in July, but I, but I think if we start in early August, we can get through some of these subjects, September and so on, so that we can set these up for 2023. The idea is we don't have a commission meeting on February 28th and surprise people for March. The idea is we put these things far enough in advance that people can change their business plans, they can transfer their licenses that they need to, they can adjust their agent, they, they have some time to make adjustments. So we don't want to spring these. So we want to start early and August so that we can try and give the industry enough time to to react to yeah. what they want to do yeah. and guide these. I got something else all right, Sanford. You know, I don't even, we all know there's a problem with too many pots, coal rings, et cetera, et cetera. No buoy numbers, whatever. Penalties. I know the, the crab straight, crab, not crab scrape, oyster scrape fishery had a lot of problems. They increased the penalties in which you receive if you are in sanctuaries, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think there needs to be a discussion about that in general. You know, hey, if, if you got closed call rings, or whatever, you should increase the penalties. It's not a popular thing, but, you know, over your limit. I mean, it's just on and on and on. And really, it's just a slap on the hand. Maybe that should be a discussion. It's you know, to look try at. to rope in some of the people that are breaking the law. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, the, Alexa, um, Adam, I appreciate your 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 all your thoughtfulness and all your work on the subject. Uh, uh, you all do a great job for us, I believe. So, thank you for that. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn. Can, can I ask one question of staff? Moore, before, yeah. You know, before we kind of had to break for COVID, there was a lot of discussion about this possible closure off Little Creek. It is closed. So we just to, no so that hasn't gone anywhere. Right. The, the, right. It, the, it, it actually hadn't it hadn't gone through the rule. The reason part. it hasn't gone to you the can't commission. Set pots down there, they'll come and tell you we tried. Right. They wouldn't let us. So the the reason they it hasn't out. gone to the commission <laughs> is because <laughs> we've we've, we've had a back and forth. <laughs> we we've had a back and forth with the U.S. Navy. The reason it hasn't gone to the commission is because here at the agency so we have switched leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a regime with a commissioner. Uh, Bowman, at that point, it was some back and forth with the Navy with what they're asking. We worked through our advisory committee to try and come to that compromise. At that point, we switched regimes. So until we have a new commissioner in place, we don't want to go ahead and do anything real rash it's and putting things on the books because you're setting, you're setting a precedent in that area. So right now, it's in a holding pattern. When we get new leadership, we will work with the Navy. It will come in front of the commission for decision and discussion, right. but that's not coming yet. Right. Okay. I, just, I just wanted an update as to Thank you. what was happening there because we had discussed it. Before we, sorry. Alexa, go ahead. Before we adjourn. I'm also going to mention that if anyone on the committee needs um, their mileage reimbursement forms, let me know. Um, we have some paper ones back in the office or we can email them to you. Great. Great. Just come okay. up and let me know. All right. So we've got a second for adjournment. All in favor. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. I'll call it. Yeah. I forgot to introduce the doctor.